Hello, I want to thank you for joining me today to talk about literature review strategies. Let's first think about why we do a literature review. As we're preparing for research, it's really important, first of all, that we are able to think about uh, the context that we're studying. What do we know, for instance, if we're doing a project about uh, Tunisia and the development of nationalism, what do we know about um, what is what took place, the historical events that existed. What do we know about the Vision 2030 in Saudi Arabia, um, what's contained in it and what its aims are. So simply getting an understanding of what the context is as a whole is a beginning step for doing your literature review. But then you also want to think about what is known, but also what questions remain. We think about this as finding the gaps in the literature, right? So if we're trying to understand why do we get um, the Vision 2030 trying to reshape Saudi society at the time it is, then what ex explanations already exist for this specific question? Um, and as you're doing so, you're trying to think about, first of all, is there an explanation that you believe is important but it hasn't been written, right? So if it has been written, then you may not need to do the study. You can look for other areas to explore other questions that remain. Um, but the second part is to recognize that when people have come to a different answer than you do, you need to think of those as alternative explanations. That these are the other, the other possible explanations for the, for the answer that you're trying to provide or for the questions um, that you're asking. And you need to be able to address why your specific answer um, is likely to be better than alternative explanations. So again, when you're doing this literature review, you're trying to understand um, kind of more broadly, what's the state of the discussion and what do we know about the answers to your question? There's two sets of answers that you're going to be looking for, right? The one is about substantively, so you're, you're specifically interested in how have they explained the emergence of the Vision 2030 and the attempts to reshape Saudi society, or how have they explained why we get a particular form of nationalism arising in Tunisia, for instance. Um, but the other part is theoretical. So your question, as Lauren Honig was talking about in the discussion of framing, is part of a larger sort of uh, discourse or a larger debate as well. So if you're thinking about it in the terms that we're doing in this in this particular project, often these are the debates over social engineering. You know, how do states attempt to change their societies? What are the obstacles that they run into? It may be that you're interested in understanding the current changes in Saudi Arabia with regards to societal reforms, but you recognize that Saudi Arabia is not the first place to ever engage in this, right? We can think about um, the sort of the secular uh, sort of reforms that took place under under Ataturk, we can think about you know Borghiba, we can think about a lot of even specific instances, and then we can think more broadly about questions of how states try to reshape societies. So when we're looking at that literature, then there's a question of, okay, what have been the broader understandings of why we get the answers that, that we do? Now, Doing a systematic literature review is particularly challenging, and it's, I think, a goal that we want to strive for and to recognize and take into account how close we get to that to meeting that goal or how far away we, we may end up being at times. Um, so it's really difficult to write a truly systematic literature review, by which I mean one that could be replicated fairly easily by another person. Um, because we make a lot of choices, often choices that we're not so explicit about as we're, as we're making them while we do the review, right? We're making choices as to what keywords we're going to use, what kinds of literature we're going to be looking at, um, what kinds of, of um, messages we're going to be focusing on. So all of those are choices, and I think that they're often made, you know, sort of implicitly um, and one of the reasons why it's hard to write a systematic review is that people don't really take them into account. So I'm going to ask you to sort of try to get into a systematic mindset, right? Really explicitly thinking about the decisions that you make as you do the search, as you read the literature, as you write up the review. So the first question is thinking simply about what types of literature and information is going to be relevant for your review. Right Again, recognizing that we have a very specific instance and in, in question in mind, right? The question about, as we said, you know, 
nationalism in Tunisia or questions about sort of what drives the Saudis to undertake reforms the way that they do at this particular point in time, or about understanding, you know, why we would get subnational variation in Yemen if we're looking at educational policies and attempts to improve girls' education. So as we're doing this, we want to be really clear, these are the sets of questions that we've looked at, and these are the ways in which we've understood um, the, the search. Okay, um, And again, you want to sort of think about not only reading this literature and knowing what, what exists, but really thinking critically about it, right? So we want to have a, an understanding of the ways in which people have brought um, evidence to bear, what has been sort of convincing and what is less convincing about the, about the information. And across all of these different points, we want to be really clear about both identifying the choices that you make and justifying them, right? So if you're going to, for example, uh, focus on a certain set of journals, or if you're going to only focus your search on most recent literature in the last decade or two decades, then you want to be explicit as to why you're ta making that choice. And others can take issue with it. That's acceptable, right? But you want to be very, very clear about what you're choosing to do. So let's step back for a moment and think about then how the literature review can help us to set, set the context. As I've mentioned already, right, part of this is going to be substantive, right? You want to be able to justify why your study needs to be done. And that's partly a question of why your study is, you know, important in terms of that it has not been done before. But it's also a question of making the case that this is an important topic, right? That it's an important for um, for example, within Yemen to understand the ways that education can be promoted because it has important consequences for women as a human rights and gender issue uh, for the society as a whole, perhaps, for example, with regards to economic growth. Um, so you can make the case that this is an important topic within the, the case site or selection that you're making the that you're implementing the research but you can also make the case when you're thinking about why it has broader implications right so that why this is important for example in um, Saudi Arabia is not only about understanding Saudi Arabia but it's about understanding kind of more broadly why you get um, sort of attempts to kind of relatively radically transform uh, gender relations, relations between religion and the state, and other sets of issues. Um, and it, part of this, too, is to understand this within the historical background, right? So it may be that what you want to focus on is not only today's importance, but why this topic has had a sort of a historical development, and why those developments might lead us to asking new questions today. The second way, again, to think about setting the context is to think about it in terms of theory, right? That one thing you're going to want to be very clear about are how you define your terms and concepts. Depending on what you're working on, you may be in a topic where there, there's contestation over what social engineering means, or there's contestation over what development is. And so you want to be very clear that this is the way in which you're going to be defining and using it here, and at times recognizing that others may have employed a different definition or have employed different concepts, but to help the reader ultimately and your, you know, sort of your audience to understand where you're coming from and what you mean. The second sort of theoretical issue again is to then be able to sort of both explain the current debates within the topic and also to be able to situate your research within it, right? So you want to say, I recognize I'm not the first person to study either the specific issue and case, or more broadly, the set of issues. Here's how I'm essentially going to engage in a conversation with others about what is convincing about previous explanations and what needs to be added in for new explanations. And throughout all of this, it's very important to acknowledge other scholars who've come before you and just basically sort of recognize the studies that have been done in the field already, and to do so with a degree of respect, right? So you don't need to be the first person who's um, studied an issue. You don't need to be the first one who's ever um, come up with an explanation for the questions that you're asking, right? You do want to acknowledge and engage with people in terms of the, the research that you're doing and that they have done. 
So thinking about identifying areas for advancing scholarship, right? It's always easy, and that's what you'll hear people talk about is a lot is finding gaps in the research, right? You know, basically, this is a question of saying, okay, what has existed out there? How can we describe the various theories and ideas that are related to your topic and the implications of these, right? So what do we already know is essentially the first question. And then we want, again, to sort of make it very clear that we're substantiating the link between the study that you're going to do, right, and the other sets of research. And again, re recalling what, what Laura and I think so very hopeful, helpfully pointed out before, which is sometimes it's, it's a very clear um, sort of uh, link between this research and previous research, but it also may be that there's other ways that you can think about what your research is addressing. So for example, if you're thinking about looking at uh, the recent Saudi reforms with regards to Vision 2030, you may want to think about it with regards to social engineering, of course, um, but you can also think about that with regards to thinking about how state states and, and kind of religious um, actors and the use of religion as a state sort of legitimation strategy, how that might change over time, right? So you can think about it in terms of states and religion. You can think about it, or religion and politics, I should say. You can think about it in terms of gender and politics, as well as around social engineering aspects. So understanding how does your study fit into these different literatures, and, and what are you adding to conversations that others have been having before you? The other thing to, to, to use a literature review for is to develop your theoretical argument, right? So at, you may decide that you're going to take a psychological perspective and that one of the things that you want to argue about or for is that um, when people are in crisis situations or in situations where they're in essentially what we've called, you know, Kahneman and Tversky think about as domains of gains or domains of losses, that people act differently. Right? So while this may not be about social engineering specifically or about your specific case and topic, when it comes to thinking about how do you make the case for your theoretical argument, you may find that you need to sort of go beyond and look at other literatures that are not necessarily the most immediate to, to the issue at, at hand, right? So essentially, and this again, I want to call back on one of the, of the messages that Lauren was making in the last um, discussion on framing, that there is a way in which read, read, read continues to be a very important message, right? That the best way that you can understand how the questions you're interested in, the kinds of issues that you feel really are um, sort of you want to grapple with the best understanding of those in terms of kind of the broader sets of conversations is to know what those broader conversations are, right? So there's a lot of value in taking the time to read and read at times beyond what you would think as the most immediate uh, relevant work. So just to give you a quick summary then, I mean, when we think about the literature reviews as a step in the research preparation, Right? First, there's a way in which what you're using it for is refining the research problem in question right? and focusing on aligning this with the context as well as the sets of constraints that you might end up doing in the, in the research. There's another point which is really important to keep in mind, which is that as you're looking at the research and you're reading critically and thinking about what's, what is convincing or less convincing about the existing explanations, you can also pinpoint methodologies in the existing research that sometimes you take issue with and you want to make sure that you don't repeat in your own work, right? And at other times you may feel very inspired by. You might decide that this is a really interesting way to approach the research and that you can take that on board as you move into designing your own project. Again, you want to find the shortcomings in previous studies so that you avoid making similar mistakes in your own and also that you can point those out as you're doing your work so that people can know why is, your, why is yours an important study to, take, to be done. And you want to have a full grasp of the field. This is going to prevent you from basically duplicating other efforts. So the last thing you want to do is spend a lot of time doing research, writing it up and having people say, but yes, you know, this, this scholar or these scholars have already said this, you know, five years ago 
a decade ago. So I want to think a little bit about how you can do your search. So the searching process itself. I mean, the first thing that you, of course, you're very familiar with, but I want you to explicitly think through in this case are the keywords. So again, what is the substantive issue of study? You know, the place you're studying, the sets of topics that you're interested in. Um, that's one set of keywords. The second are the relevant theoretical perspectives, right? So again, you know, this is a case of uh, developing nationalism. It's a case of, social, of, of, you know, kind of social engineering by the state. It's a case of gender equality. What are the theoretical questions that are kind of broader that you need to bring to bear in the research that you're going to do? And for all of this, again, I can't stress enough that you want to be very careful in keeping sort of, you know, a, a log essentially of the decisions that you're making so that if later somebody says, but did you look at this literature, you can easily say, yes, I did, or no, I need to do that. But it's that you have a, an ongoing log and, and um, accountability to the perspectives of the, and the, the search that you're taking. Again, the second issue is the question of what are the parameters of your search. So if you're looking at you know, journals or books, um, you may be able to find literature reviews that are done, have been done on the specific topic that you are interested in. Um, so there's the annual review of political science that can be very useful, annual review of economics, of sociology. There's a series called the annual reviews, and every year uh, they choose scholars to write you know, kind of critical overviews of where, what is the state of the field if we're thinking about clientelism or if we're thinking about um, social engineering or we're thinking about these different sets of issues. What do we know about these today? So those can be very, very helpful. They're not the only source that you, that you should use, but they can be a very helpful way to um, looking at the literature and getting a kind of a first instance view of it. Um, there's also a number of other questions, right? So these, the, the questions about, you know, the sources that you're using. Are these going to be peer-reviewed, reputable journals? I would encourage you for, uh, to focus on, especially when you're doing the academic literature review, when you're looking at the literature that helps to inform where you situate your study in terms of the theory, then really use literature and, and journals and publishers who are well recognized where you can feel that the literature is, or the, the research is more likely to have been um, vetted well. You also want to think about the dates. Are you going to be looking again at recent literature? Are you going to be looking at older literature? Some people use a question about the numbers of times that different uh, articles have been cited um, as a way of thinking about you know, like limiting to what what at least are seem to be the most influential pieces in the in the field that you're looking at. Um, and then again, when you go back to thinking about the keywords, you know, how are you going to structure this? Are you thinking about, you know, saying it needs to be about, you know, gender and uh, state policies? Do you think about sort of gender? Do you think about state policies? Are you thinking about um, sort of the proximity of how important these uh, these words or uh, these words are to each other? Um, so does it need to be gender policy at, within quotations as a single search word? There are a number of organizational and search tools that you can use. Uh, the first and kind of most old-fashioned, but I think a very useful thing to keep in mind is a lot of people uh, start with more recent literature and look at the references and the pieces that are cited within that and essentially work backwards, right? So you can tell that if, if in the work that's coming out in 2023, you know, there's something that's been cited that's still from 1970 or 1980, it's likely to be a seminal article, right? Something that most people in the field feel is a very important sort of foundational piece for understanding the questions that you're looking at. So the other is, of course, is there's a number of search engines. Scopus has the largest article database. Um, Web of Science, Google Scholar um, are good ways to be able to get an understanding of what has been done. And of course, we now have a number of AI search tools, right? And, and here I think um, there's something called Research Rabbit where you can say, okay, here are a number of, of um, articles or, or authors who might be, have already written along the topics that I'm interested in, and what else do we 
see along these lines. Um, so just again, to give you a better sense of the AI tools, there's Research Rabbit, there's a something called Dimensions.ai, which helps you to basically kind of sort and search through various literatures and gives you analytics, illicit semantic scholar. We're not going to go through each of these at this moment. The point is to point out that that this is a new, of course, set of tools that are on the table to be used. Um, but also to really, really emphasize the importance of double checking the AI results and understanding their limitations, right? These are very early um, uh, versions of these search mechanisms and what we'll see in a moment are also some abilities to do summaries of articles. Um, they have been known to bring up or suggest that there are articles that exist that actually are fictional, right? So you could ask for a set of articles around social engineering in Saudi Arabia or social engineering and nationalism and get a whole set of, of supposed citations, right? Um, and then you would actually learn that they don't actually exist, right? So it's really, really important not to put uh, too much stake into the sort of the answers that AI is giving you. And yet at the same time, like any other tool, I mean, it does exist and it's very useful to um, ask, you know, to, to, to ask Research Rabbit to find you articles that are similar to say something like, you know, Jim Scott seeing like a state or, 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 you know, other Benedict Anderson, so in, thing, in terms of thinking about nationalism and the development of it. So use the tools, but simply be careful and, and be aware of the fact that they can lead you astray, right? So you want to take them with a grain of salt and you want to use them critically just like you want to do everything else, right? So I think one of the most important lessons or, or points that can be made today is, you know, read critically, think critically, Try to do your work systematically. So let's also talk a little bit about reading techniques, right? Because I think one of the things that may be daunting, at least to some in doing the literature review, is you can get literally thousands of articles coming back that say, you know, these are all uh, articles or pieces that have been written around nationalism. I mean, it's a huge, huge field, right? So. You know, first you want to be very clear in sort of narrowing it down, but then you also want to be very clear when you're reading so that you're reading basically kind of efficiently and effectively. So the first part of reading is really to essentially kind of learn the practice of skimming, okay? Um, one way to think about it is to kind of do a, a three-pass approach, right? First, simply to look at the piece and say, okay, what does the title say? Read the abstract. What are the headings? What do I think is going to be covered? in this particular piece. You know, the second thing is then to sort of read a bit more carefully, look at the introduction, look at the beginnings and sort of the endings of different sections, understand the points that are going to be made, read the conclusion, right? All of this is to sort of situate yourself and say, okay, I understand that this article is about. You may actually, in the process of doing so, realize that while this is an incredibly interesting article about, you know, whatever the topic is, it's actually not one that's relevant to the main question that you're interested in that you're asking, in which case you can you can stop there and you move on to the next piece to decide if that is actually going to be an important piece for your work. But the third aspect, if you've decided that it is a relevant article, it is something that you want to take a closer look at, is to then read strategically, right? So you're going to now really sort of like, you know, kind of more closely read this and take down the sort of the important information. So signposts are going to be very, very useful for you in doing that, right? So ask yourself what are the questions that you want to be you know, answering, right? So that you can recognize them. So if, if, for instance, you were doing an overall literature review about social engineering literature, right? You may say, okay, I'm interested in understanding when do states engage in social engineering, right? What obstacles might arise or, or what challenges might be posed to them what are the techniques that they might be using to be able to uh, advance their um, advance their agenda, and you know to what extent is it successful? So you might have those sort of four questions in mind. As you're reading them, look for the sort of the answers very specifically to those those questions, right? You know, look at the sort of the paragraphs that 
introduce sections and those that summarize them, they will often help you to kind of really understand where the article is going and what the author is arguing. Pay a lot of attention to the conclusions. Again, use this as a time to think about where, what is in their literature review, what is the emphasis. Think about sort of the, the ways in which they're making assumptions, right? So, you know, what are the underlying expectations? What are the underlying thoughts um, and, and assumptions in this work? And then again, we can sort of think about a number of tools, right? So if we're taking notes, we can think about something like Avid Note or Zotero is another good note-taking tool. Um, these can help you. In, in Avid Note, for example, you can um, input articles, take the notes within them. And you can also use things like tags, and we'll talk about that in a moment, that will help you to um, be able to know, okay, this article talked about you know, the strategies that states take in attempting to advance their, their goals. Okay. Again, there are AI uh, summaries or, and, and tools out there, but really, really be aware of the limitations. And again, double check these results. Simply do not use AI to write your literature review or to determine what the gap in the research is. Um, and then there's a number of things that will essentially help you to uh, kind of make reading the papers easier. And these tools change very frequently, so I'm not, again, not going to go into any of them in depth, but the idea is for you to recognize that you can find a lot of tools out there, but that you really should be very, very um, careful in your use and employment of them. The other thing I want to sort of emphasize, I'm going to emphasize this a couple of times because I can't, I can't probably stress it enough, is to avoid inadvertent plagiarism. So it can be very easy to... Uh, copy a piece of text that, you know, into your notes, um, forget to make it so obvious that this is a quotation, later be writing up, realize that it sounded pretty good the way you thought you wrote it the first time. Of course, you didn't write it, somebody else did, but that the way that it's in your notes, you copy and paste it into your, into your paper and suddenly you've plagiarized even when you had no intention of doing so. So uh, what I tend to do is if I'm going to copy a chunk of text, um, you can, you can try to sort of put quotation marks around it, and obviously that's a good thing to do. Um, but even when you do that, you may be ultimately at some point copy the three sentences that were in the center of that and forget that there's quotation marks, right? So also if you put it in italics and bold or if you put it in a different color, it becomes very easy to identify this text as a direct quote. And so you either want to directly quote it if you were going to use it or you want to be able to kind of paraphrase it if you're going to move it into your, into your work. I said this a few times, but I, I want to really, really stress the importance of reading critically. What is the argument that's being made? What is the evidence that is being brought to bear in the study, right? So um, is the evidence actually, if they're saying that this is, uh, that, it, that it is, you know, making a point and substantiating their point, does it actually? And sometimes even you'll read direct quotes where it says, you know, that as this set of people has explained, you know, X happens. But then you really carefully read the quotation and you realize that nothing about the quote says that they've explained that X happens, right? So you want to be very, very careful as you read the evidence and as you read the article to think about what the evidence is and think about really how convincing is the study. And there's a lot of reasons why it may be convincing for what it's doing but might not answer the question that you're asking or might not sort of translate into an answer for you. So, you know, one question is, you know, to, to what extent does a sample of the population in that study generalize more broadly, right? Is there something very specific, we, you know, about, for example, a study that is um, using undergraduates at the American University of Cairo to determine how people respond to stress, right? Is that a, a population or a sample that translates to, you know, all students? Does that does it generalize to all Egyptians? Does it generalize to all people? You know, so how far can we take the evidence that's been provided um, to generalize? When is the when did the study take place and have things changed? Right. So we know that we're in many ways in quite a fast changing world. Um, to what extent should we expect that a study that was, say, for example, um, 
implemented and, and undertaken on even something like gender biases from 2010 or 2015, you know, 10 or 20 years later, does that still, does that still tell us about what gender biases exist and the implications of them um, in, say, for example, Egypt or Jordan? Okay. Um, I mentioned this before, but again, think about whether or not the evidence in the measurement of sort of different concepts are really mapping on to the theory and the extent then to, to which the results hold. And finally, as you're reading, really continue to think about what insights do you glean regarding methodology as well as what insights do you re glean regarding your theory. So again, uh, with a little bit more detail in terms of thinking about the reading and organizational tools that you can use, um, there's Avid Note, which will help you sort of allow you to also bring in PDFs and take notes within them. Um, there's Scholarcy, which helps to summarize articles. Size Summary, which is very similar, or Paper Digest, as examples of tools that can be useful. Um, and then something called lateral, which helps you to kind of organize, take notes. Um, you can basically, again, drop in entire articles and search within it. Um, third time, I will not sort of stop from emphasizing the two really important points. Um, recognizing these are really in the early stages of development, so don't let AI be your researcher. You should never you know, sort of turn your intellectual capacity over to to anybody else, but certainly not to artificial intelligence. Um, and again, avoid inadvertent plagiarism. Finally, there's Audemic, right, which can also help you with sort of accessibility uploading articles. And you can there, in that case, you can listen to it like an audio book. Um, and that can help you particularly if you're um, needing to be able to do things at the at the same time or to be able to listen to something as you're as you're moving. Be careful. It's also very, of course, easy to to um, kind of zone out when you're listening to to audiobooks. Next, I want to talk a little bit about how you organize your notes, right? So I think a lot of us have uh, a tendency to um, you know read an article often from simply sort of picking it up, reading it like you would a novel from the you know first sentence to the last sentence and taking a lot of notes along the way. Um, and so there's kind of two problems with that, right? One is that uh, you denied yourself the chance to sort of understand the article better the way that you would if you practiced the kind of the three-step skimming techniques. Um, but the second is that you may find that, that you have a lot of notes on very interesting issues that you ultimately might not um, might not need. If you know already that you're not so interested in understanding the historical context of a certain period or that you're not really, um, that, that your research is not really about the implications of different policies, but rather about how those policies came into being, then taking a lot of notes about you know parts of the of a study that are not what you're working on are simply going to be um, more time consuming than necessary at the moment. But the other part is to really figure out a way to organize things such that when it's time to you know get a more comprehensive understanding of what exists in the literature now that you've done a lot of reading and things start to kind of jumble in your mind, um, and also to be able to start to write, then how can we? How can we have tags or have headings or different sort of techniques that we can use to make sure that you can that you can find the different sections or notes easily? So again, one is to use tags. So if you wanted to do a, a, a program for, or a project where you're saying, um, you know, reason for policies, uh, obstacles to success, you know, uh, tools employed. If we're doing the literature review, for example, about social engineering more generally, you could use those tags. Be very careful to keep them consistent because ultimately when you do a search, if you've used lots of different words to have the same concept in mind, then you're going to actually find it quite difficult to find things. Um, but you can also do something very old-fashioned, which is, tends to be what I do in here. You basically can use an Excel or other database where what you're really doing is saying, okay, uh, here's the citation, uh, here's the abstract, 
you know, did they answer a question about what tools are being used, for instance, have that be a column, and then you can put the various notes and quotations and page numbers into the, to each of these. It may be that you're reading a piece that talks about what tools are used but doesn't talk about why a state may decide to implement different policies, in which case you, you know, leave that column empty and later when you're you know, kind of you can use the sorting function to leave the kind of empty columns to the bottom and only look at what do I know are the answers to what tools are used across these pieces? What do I know are the answers to what prompted, you know, kind of new policies across these different pieces? Now I want to talk a little bit about writing. So there are essentially two types of literature reviews that we can think about writing. Um, one are sort of standalone literature reviews. These are those state-of-the-art kind of overviews that I talked about that you could find examples of in the annual review of, review of political science, the annual review of economics, or other annual review uh, journals as well as you can often find them in, um, in other journals at different times, right? But these are places where you basically always know that you can find a sort of state-of-the-art literature review. Um, and these tend to be very good literature reviews. Again, they tend to be written by very senior, senior and seasoned scholars um, who are essentially have a lot of experience both in the specific field that they're writing on, but also on writing these types of pieces. Um, so if you're writing that type of piece, then the challenge is to synthesize an extremely large body of literature, right, into kind of manageable bites. And you can do that by thinking about what are the various, you know, questions that have been asked within this broader field or what are the various uh, approaches that have been taken within this broader field. Um, the second, of course, issue with this type of literature review is that you're not only there to kind of repeat what is known, but you're there to provide direction for future work, right? So the question isn't simply, uh, you know, here's a synthesis of what is what is already out there, but here are, again, identifiable research gaps, right, that, you know, scholars and others are encouraged to address. The second type of literature review is what we'll call an embedded literature review, and this is the, the kind that most people are writing most of the time. And this is the literature review that gets embedded within a lot, you know, kind of a, a broader uh, research article. So it's making the case that the research question hasn't been answered or hasn't been answered sufficiently. So what do we already know, but also what do we not know? So that's the identifying the gap, right? It's providing a lot of times a basis for the theory that's going to be used, and it's usually one of the first sections of a research chapter or, or, or a research article, right? So it's often, you know, in that section that says, you know, here's my introduction, here's the, you know, why this was an important question and what I'm going to tell you, we know about it. Now we're going to tell you what has already been known, already been done and already been known. There's a lot of sort of what I want to think of as in common mistakes to avoid, okay? The first is it's surprising the numbers of times that you will lead a, read a literature review that doesn't clearly relate to the study at hand. It tells you a lot about the topic, right? Um, in fact, sometimes tells you an enormous amount about the topic, but it doesn't actually situate itself so that it is telling you why you need to have the research that you're going to be reading um, done. It doesn't necessarily clearly explain what the sort of main question is, and it doesn't set up why you would be approaching the research from the, from the approach that will be taken, right? Um, the second main problem often that you'll see in literature reviews is that they're not necessarily using either the best or the most um, relevant sources, right? So you will you know, see literature reviews that are on um, you know, kind of a very extensive uh, and, and sort of important set of literature and, and research questions. And what people will have done is, you know, chosen two or three uh, pieces that sort of everybody knows, um, used those, and sort of moved on as if nobody else had said anything, right? So that is uh, problematic, first of all, because it's 
you know, in a sense, a bit dishonest if you're going to tell me that this is where the state of the literature is, that it doesn't actually do that. Um, but the other real big problem with it is that what you know, when you sort of send it out to people, uh, the people who've done that research are the people who will often be reviewing your articles or looking at your, your reading your work, um, and they will feel underappreciated as they've been um, and and unheard, right? So you definitely want to make sure that you're bringing in the most important sets of literature. Um, another uh, factor that you'll see, and it's quite surprising, is that a lot of times people will rely on and sort secondary sources than, rather than primary ones. Um, sometimes that's apparent because they'll actually say X as cited in this. It's a it's an it's a justifiable move if you're looking at something that's very historical, right? So some obscure diary piece or, 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 or work that was, you know, from the 1800s that's out of print and you can't find and all you've found is that you, you, know, you think this is a very important piece in quotation, so you're using it in your literature review. Um, then yes, of course you can sort of rely on the secondary source and, and cite that source, you know, appropriately. Um, the other thing that's very interesting, so and I think it's an important um, uh, point to flag, is that often the people you're citing uh, will be reading the work that you're citing. So it's not unusual for me to read, some, for example, somebody who is citing something that they say I've said. And, you know, when they've read the piece themselves, Right, they tend not to make a, a mistake in understanding what was the main point of the piece. But when what they're doing instead is, you know, citing a piece that had earlier misread, you know, kind of an article that I had written or under uh, misread something, you can start to see kind of a pattern of okay, you know, here are here's a third time that you're seeing a misreading of your work, and you're pretty sure that these people have not actually read your work that. Um, that it's hard to understand how you would have it misread three times, and instead what they're doing is simply looking at somebody else's literature review and essentially kind of repeating what mistakes existed in that literature review. So for yourself, because you learn a lot, because you get new ideas, because it is so important for you to sort of, you know, read the literature, know where things stand, and think critically about it, you know, rely on the primary sources, and don't try to take some shortcuts that would mean, okay, I know that if this piece is always cited, this is what people say it says, and so let me simply um, recite it here. Um, a fourth major problem that we often see within the within the um, sort of the the review is that it often doesn't really critically examine the findings and interpretations that are included in the in the literature, right? So we want not only to know that this is what the author says that they're saying, um, but the extent to which we should think those findings transfer or are appropriate uh, to the question that you're asking, either because times have changed or it, you know, it doesn't matter the times have changed or because it's a different um, case and site of research. So thinking very critically about those findings is important and should be noted when you're when you're talking about the literature, right? So while these findings have been important, you know, I think that they are not relevant or they're not, they don't sufficiently answer the question that I'm addressing here because of these um, these following reasons. Um, and also, you know, it's good practice to note what are the search procedures, what are the site, you know, the sort of the keywords, etc. You don't usually see that done, um, but it is a good practice to start uh, getting into. So then to summarize, I mean, when you're organizing your literature review, right, you want to set it, your argument, you want to use the literature review to set up your argument. Um, you want to synthesize what is known, right? So another thing that you'll often see people do is write a literature review where one paragraph says, author A has said this and talks about what author A has said. And then paragraph two says author B has said this and talks about what author B has said. And paragraph three, so, so it continues to do sort of a, almost a paragraph by paragraph summary of the various article, articles or, or arguments that, are, that have been made. What you want to do instead is think about these as sets of arguments, right? So, you know, Argument A, which says that it's structure that, under, that, that explains why we get um, a successful policy, right? It might be social structure or economic structure, et cetera. 
you know, and authors A, B, and D have talked about this, right? While others have talked about agency. And so articles, you know, authors C and F have talked about this. So, so rather than focusing your literature review on individual, um, individual authors and their, their studies, then you should be focusing your literature review around the sets of arguments that exist. Right. So that's what I'm arguing here is basically just synthesize the main arguments. Right. So organize it by argument. Think about it in terms of topics or by regions. You could say, OK, you know, a lot of the research has come out of Western Europe and this is what they have found. Right. Another paragraph can say much less attention has been given to this in the Middle East. Right. You know, these two studies have talked about it but they've not exactly looked at the questions I'm asking, right? So you know, giving examples, very clearly specifying the authors and, you know, in often sort of a one sentence or two sentence example of what they've said, right? But avoiding these sort of long uh, paragraph summaries of the individual pieces. And finally, you want to think about balancing detail and breadth, right? So you want to give enough detail to help explain what others are saying, but not so much detail that the author, I'm sorry, the reader has started to forget what the main point point is. As you're writing, again, be very critical of the research that has been done before, but also do it so constructively, right? So your idea is not to sort of tear down everything that has come before you and suggest you are the only person who can provide an adequate answer to this, but really to think very critically, but also, again, constructively. And as part of that, it's a kind of a broader call to be fair to other authors, right? Avoid straw man arguments. Nobody else has studied this. Everybody who's studied it has studied it, you know, fully wrong, right? Um, you know, and essentially kind of exercise a degree of humility, right? So, you know, you're part of a broader conversation. You have something to add, and that's very important. But you don't have to be the only person who's made an, article, or an argument and you, or the only person who's ever taken, you know, a, a particular approach. So again, to final, final sort of wrap up, um, important to think in your when you're approaching your literature review and when you're approaching kind of reading the literature more generally, what is the goal, right? What are the questions you're asking? What are you really trying to sort of understand and, and find out? Make a plan, right? So I think that at least today, what I understand my question to be about is about, you know, gender, nationalism, uh, it's basically, you know, sort of state policies and social engineering um, with regards to, you know, Yemen and education, right? These are the sets of keywords. This is a set of literature. As you're reading, you may say, wow, wait a second, there's a whole other, uh, you know, angle to this I haven't been looking at. Other authors have noted it. I need to include it. Doesn't mean don't revise your plan, but certainly have kind of a clear sense of what you want to look at. Think about what type of literature is going to be useful. Again, for situating your work in the academic debates, then, you know, peer-reviewed, internationally sort of uh, recognized journals and articles and, and publishers are an important source of literature, and they're the ones that people are going to feel like they understand what conversation you're fitting your, your research into. Um, but you can also think that you know, in terms of understanding simply the setting the context and what policies have been made, you may be looking at government documents or you may be looking at, you know, UN or other sets of reports, right? So it doesn't mean that the only literature that you can be using is the academic literature, but but with regards to situating your work in terms of an academic conversation, then the academic literature is going to be very key. Define the search parameters, right? Again, thinking very clearly about, you know, both what the timing is, you know, what, how far back are you going to go in time, how are you going to determine what are some of the most important sets of articles, are you looking at the top 10 peer-reviewed journals in this particular field, are you looking at the top cited, you know, articles, are you looking at, you know, sort of a, a spectrum across, you know, different types of research, okay. 
practice skimming, right? Because it will save you a lot of time. There's going to be a lot of things that your searches bring up that are not necessary for your particular project. Might be very interesting later on to go back and look at, but you know, so once you've essentially sort of come up with your set of, of um, research, then you want to sort of look through it and use this sort of three pass uh, skimming technique, right? And then use the, soft, the software, um, tags, searching, note-taking, other tools to really help you not only find the literature and, and review it, but also to really help you to organize the literature so that when it comes time to writing the review, you can be sort of best, best prepared to write it effectively. Um, with that, again, I want to thank you for joining me and for, for thinking through the literature review and the literature search process, um, everything from how do we search to how do we write an effective literature review. Um, and I'm happy to hear any questions or comments. Thank you.